Praise the Lord, everyone. It is 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening, and that means, of course, it is time for our midweek Bible study. We greet you this evening, of course, as always, in the wonderful saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And uh, we greet you. We're glad you're able to be with us this evening. We're in the midst of uh, what is going to, if it isn't already, it's going to shape up to be <clears throat> one of the most powerful, inspiring, uh, important Bible study series that we've ever done and that you will have ever heard. And uh, I hope your heart is ready to receive from the Word of God tonight. We, this thing is going to start to move this week. We're moving into some really uh, exciting areas. And I think tonight in particular, I'm really excited about uh, tonight. And uh, I think, though, in the weeks to come, if you are an individual who has wrestled with um, spiritual influences, things going on in your home, uh, things going on um, in whatever environment you may be experiencing things, uh, I think you're going to find by the end of this study that you are empowered to deal with these issues. It is not necessary always to bring someone in who's able to do things. Uh, the most important tool that we have is faith. Faith, the Word of God said, is the victory that overcomes the world, meaning there is not anything in this universe that is able to overcome our faith if we are in fact and indeed operating by faith. So the most important weapon you can have in dealing with spiritual influences is faith in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I realize, of course, if you're not a Christian and you're watching this series, uh, you're going to say, oh, you know, that's just their sales pitch. That's always what they're going to say. No, that is not what we're always going to say. That's the truth. The reality is the spirit realm, in fact, and indeed exists. But folks, um, if the evil exists, then so does the good. If there is a devil, then so also is there a God. I mean, it ought to stand to reason. This is the most basic, logical um, understanding we can possibly come to. Okay, you know, if you've got one, you must have the other. And uh, so it's terribly important for those of you that are watching. If you have never been born again the Bible way, I don't mean praying a quote-unquote sinner's prayer. I don't mean, uh, you know, shaking the preacher's hand and joining a church. I mean born again according to the mandate of Scripture. This ministry embraces the full apostolic uh, standard for salvation as outlined by the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for this promise is unto you and to your children, to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That means that that message was the message to be preached down through the ages until the return of Christ. That is the full, truthful biblical apostolic plan of salvation. And that was the message preached by the apostles and the early church. All right, I don't want to get too churchy on you, but I'm trying to let you know, folks, the truth is faith is the most powerful weapon you'll ever have. Before we go into our Bible study today, of course, we like to open with prayer. So if you'll bow your heads with me, 
Master, we love you, God, today, and we thank you for this opportunity once again to delve into the Word of God. We're looking, Master, at the subject of spiritual warfare. We're looking at spiritual things, the spirit world, the spirit realm, and many people in our world today. As the end of this age draws nearer, we understand that so, too, will spiritual activity in our in our world. And many people, Lord, have um, experimented with this, and they've looked into this, and they've wandered into areas where they ought not to have gone. They've opened doors they ought not to have opened. And Master, tonight I pray that right now in the name of Jesus, you would touch hearts and help the listener, the viewer, to have a heart and a mind that is capable and tender to hearing what the Spirit of the Lord would speak unto the church of God this hour. Master, let us be receptive. Let us today understand that which we've heard, allow revelation to occur as we listen and as we watch this study. For Lord, we understand today so many things from the Word of God. We can have them presented to us. It can be as clear as black and white. And yet, if the Spirit of God, if your Spirit does not work with the printed page, revealing and confirming in our heart and in our mind that that which we see and hear is in fact truth, then it is just empty sound. It means very little. We need the anointing. We need revelation. We need you to open our understanding. Grant it this hour, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I want to get right into this this week. As I've said, I'm really excited about where we're going. Last week, I made reference to the principle of uh, two or three witnesses being required to establish anything. And I shared two passages from the Old Testament law in which the Lord um, set forth this principle. However, there was one passage I failed to sh share that I meant to share, uh, which helps us understand that this is not merely a principle that applies to the law, but it applies to every word that comes from God. And in 2 Corinthians 13 and 1, the word of the Lord says, Paul is writing to the church uh, in the city of Corinth, and he says, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So that's important to understand, as I was saying before. Um, there are false prophets out there who have uh, preached a, another message, a new message. They claim to have the truth, like Joseph Smith. You know, I've got the truth, and all churches are liars. All Christian churches are deceived. And yet the the very act of his coming forth and claiming to be the one true and only prophet with the truth uh, is in and of itself inaccurate because out of the mouth or in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word, every word be established. Therefore, if God were raising up the message that Joseph Smith preached, for instance, then he would have raised up someone somewhere else also preaching the identical same message, also claiming the same revelation. And then this way they could have acted to confirm one another. But Every single religious text, every religious book 
uh, that is embraced by the Mormon Church was written by Joseph Smith and Joseph Smith alone. So that uh, immediately lets us know it does not reach God's standard. Okay, now. Last week, we also talked about, I've been talking about something that is highly controversial, not because Scripture doesn't speak plainly on the subject, but because people do not want to simply accept what the Word of God says. It makes them uncomfortable. They, you know, they want to believe it a little different. And the fundamentalists and evangelicals have twisted and perverted. I grew up in the evangelical fundamentalist movement, folks. I love the people. I love the church I grew up in. I love much of uh, what I learned growing up. There was so much positivity in my experience growing up, even as um, uh, a person of LGBT. Uh, orientation, I still have no complaints. The church I grew up in was very loving. The people loved God. They were committed to the Lord. Back then, you didn't have all this culture war foolishness going on. You didn't have preachers uh, preaching the way they do today uh, on issues like abortion and gay people and that. Uh, I was taught to love everybody, and it didn't matter who walked through the door of our church we loved them, and, and you didn't beat them and bash them over the head. Now, I know it was a little different in the fundamentalist evangelical churches in the South, but that was my experience in the Northeast, which has always been a very diverse, uh, racially diverse, especially, uh, place. But anyway, um, so when I speak on issues related to evangelicalism and fundamentalism. Um, I am speaking it prophetically, meaning I am speaking it as a word of correction, oftentimes as a word of rebuke, but I assure you there is no malice in my heart toward the evangelical and fundamentalist movements per se. I do not agree with a, a number of points of doctrine today, uh, with them. However, again, um, I don't agree with Episcopalians. I don't agree with Roman Catholic. I don't agree with a number of people. Uh, but you don't have to be hateful toward people simply because you don't agree. Uh, our church over the years, we have rented uh, Episcopalian uh, sanctuaries. We've shared Episcopalian sanctuaries and had our services in Episcopalian churches, and the pastors of those churches can tell you that uh, they and I got along famously. We got along wonderfully. I acknowledge all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as believers. I acknowledge that, and I love them for the fact that they hold faith in Jesus Christ. I may believe, you know, they need to approach things differently. They need to do things differently. Uh, but again, I'm not going to argue with people. I'm not going to debate with people. That is unscriptural. That is not how we are to conduct ourselves. So I love folks, and I can love anybody. I love Mormon folks. I love Jehovah's Witness folks. I love people who are involved in Scientology. I don't have one one lick of malice or negativity in my heart toward any of these people, okay? So listen, um, so here is, here is an issue that the fundamentalist and evangelical camp is going to choke on. I'm going to warn you right now, they're going to choke on their teeth. Last week, as well as at other points in our study, I've spoken about the fact that God created evil. He created the other side of the coin. In order to accomplish what he was seeking to accomplish, he had to have both sides of the coin. 
the yin and the yang, to borrow from uh, Chinese uh, language and terminology. You had to have the black, the white. You had to have the light, the darkness. You had to have the chocolate, the vanilla. You had to have the good and the evil. How do I know for a fact this is true? The Word of God says it through the prophet Isaiah as clearly as it can be said. Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 7. I am the Lord. The word Lord here is uh, translated from the term that we often use, Jehovah. I am the Lord, or I am Jehovah, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. Now, mind you, through the prophet Isaiah, he's talking to the nation of Israel, okay? He said, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. This is why we preach, teach, and believe there is one God and one God only. He said, I am the Lord, and there is none else. Verse 7, Isaiah 45, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. That passage right there, you're going to have fundamentalists and evangelical folks running around like chickens with their head chopped off trying to explain this away. I grew up where uh, any passage that was uncomfortable to us uh, in the reading, all of a sudden the pastor would say, what this really means is, <laughs> because you can't trust what you're seeing, you can't trust the words you've just read, what this really means is, well, what this really means is that God created both sides of the coin. We're going to move further in understanding this right now. Okay, <coughs> it's important to understand as we're moving now into what I like to refer to as uh, rules of the spirit realm. There are specific rules that God has established that apply to the spirit realm. And we're going to be looking at these rules. Now, understand there are rules that God instituted. Excuse me one moment. The rules that God instituted uh, are not strictly related to the enemy or to the evil side of the coin. That would be unjust. That would be unfair. God literally set forth certain rules, as it were, uh, that applied not only to the other side, but as well to himself. So God's plan of redemption for fallen man, for instance, included rules or it included parameters. It literally put the Lord in a box. Every prophecy concerning the Messiah, for instance, put God in a box. It required that he had to do the work that he was doing in this specific way. He couldn't change his mind, couldn't approach it a little different. And this is one of the reasons why when the Lord revealed himself to humanity in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that there was possibility of failure. The human nature that was wrapped around the divine nature within could have motivated uh, the Lord to make a choice that contradicted the initial will and word of God, but he didn't. Thank God for that. Uh, we are grateful that he didn't veer from the plan. He stuck with 
the plan. But this is why in the temptation in the wilderness, you know, the devil said, turn these uh, stone into bread, throw yourself down from this high place. I'll give you all these kingdoms. The human nature in the hunger and in the physical struggle and distress that the Lord was in at that moment, the human nature might have motivated him to make a choice which would have blown the whole plan out of the water because God had literally written himself into a box, said uh, the Messiah has to come this way. All these prophets for hundreds and hundreds and thousands even of years had been offering various prophecies concerning the Messiah. And every one of them had to uh, come to fruition or else the entire plan would not have been legitimate. God created rules and he applied rules even to himself. Had one prophecy concerning Messiah gone unfulfilled, the plan he set forth from the beginning of the world would have been a failure. Thus, in the temptation of the Lord in the wilderness by Satan himself, uh, not only are we is this story shared with us to demonstrate the Lord's poten potential for failure as the influence of the flesh could have motivated the humanity of the Lord to divert from the prophesied plan and take an easier road to glory. But at the same time, this story also illustrates, listen carefully, the deception that is built into Satan's makeup. Say, well, what do you mean by that? Satan was designed to believe, Lucifer was designed to believe he could accomplish those things which arise within his imagination. He honestly believes he can win the battle and sit in the Lord God Almighty's throne. He believes that. He must be convinced of this or else he would not fight and do that for which he was designed. If he didn't believe this, then he might come to his senses, so to speak, and say, okay, God, um, I quit, I surrender, I don't want to wind up ruling hell through eternity. I'd rather at least be in your presence. You're still God, but I'd, st I'd rather be in your presence throughout eternity rather than rule in hell. Um, so therefore, he has to be convinced of this delusion as it were, okay? Over and over again, Satan tried to frustrate the plan of God. The mass murder of infants, infants by Herod upon learning of the prophesied Messiahs having been born uh, in Bethlehem, according to the wise men from the east who were familiar with those prophecies, was just one example of Satan's attempt to secure the soul of every human being ever to be born upon the earth. He knew that once the Lord had finished the work on the cross, he was powerless at that point to do anything. Okay, listen carefully. This is exciting. When Jesus said, whoo, glory, when Jesus said on the cross of Calvary, it is finished and gave up the ghost, released his spirit. Satan was stopped dead in his tracks. He had to stop Jesus according to the rules. He had to stop Jesus before he died on the cross. 
He tried to do it. He tried to talk the Lord into throwing himself down from a high place. He tried to uh, have the Lord killed as a baby at the order of Herod. He tried a number of times. He motivated men to try to stone the Lord, but the Lord just almost invisibly passed through the crowd and just walked away. He tried to destroy the Lord prior to Calvary, prior to the cross, because he knew, I have to frustrate the plan before he dies. Why was it uh, particular? Why in particular did he have to do it before he died? I'll share that with you in a second. Let me just read to you John 19, 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing, listen, that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, even at the finish line, even at the very moment before his death, God had written himself into a box. There was a prophecy about Messiah being offered vinegar. And it says that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. So even when he got to the very end of his mission, there was one last prophecy that he had to fulfill. And now there was set a vessel of vinegar. And they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. I'm going to tell you, there was a song years ago, a beautiful song. I love this song in the church of God that we used to sing. And uh, it's called The Time of the Ages. And the chorus says, "'Twas the time of the ages, time for Calvary, the hour had come. Heaven wept and hell was raging. But the price sin demanded was paid for everyone. I'm not of good singing voice today. But the lyrics in that song are not accurate. They're not correct. They're actually turned around. It says, heaven wept. Woo, hallelujah. Well, I want to shout a little. Folks, this is real to me. My faith is real. I believe this message. This isn't just religion. This is real in my soul. But the song said, heaven wept and hell was raging. Hell was partying, boy. Part hell was having a party when Jesus said, no, no, no. The opposite is true. Heaven was partying, hallelujah, and hell was weeping. Because the moment he died and gave up the ghost, it was done. It was finished. There was nothing the enemy could do after the Lord's death to frustrate the plan of salvation. And some might say, well... But could he not have prevented the Lord from rising from the dead? Because his rising from the dead was uh, uh, the biggest part of, and we're going to be celebrating that Sunday. Uh, that was the biggest part of the plan. So could not the devil have done something? Well, let's see. According to Acts 2, 22 through 27, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, 
being delivered by the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God. In other words, none of that happened by accident. None of that happened by mistake. God, that was all part of the plan from word go. He said, uh, him ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Now listen to the next sentence. Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So why did Satan have to frustrate the plan before the Lord died? Easy. Because it was impossible possible for Jesus to stay dead. It was impossible by reason of his identity. He was God in the flesh. It was impossible for Satan to deny the Spirit of God access to the body of Christ so he could put it back on like a robe and push the, the stone away and walk out of the tomb alive, alive, alive forevermore. Hallelujah. It was impossible. This is why the enemy had to frustrate the plan of salvation prior to his death. Now let me continue in Acts 2. I'm getting excited. I'm going to get myself a stroke. For David speaketh concerning him. Again, a prophecy. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Said God's not going to allow Messiah to corrupt. He's not going to allow Messiah to uh, his body to die and remain dead. He said, no, he's not going to allow that. So therefore, according to the parameters of the rules set forth by God, it was impossible. Oh, hallelujah to God. Folks, when you know who Jesus is, this is why if you got a devil in your home, you got a devil in your family, you got a devil vexing you or causing you grief and trouble, if you believe this gospel as I'm preaching it today, honey, there ain't a devil in the universe. I don't care how many cabinets they open and close. I don't care how many doors they cause to bang. I don't care how much noise or how much roaring they do. You will be able to face them with absolutely no fear and take authority over them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you understand who Jesus is, if you understand what Jesus did, if you understand the work of salvation, Oh, I'm going to tell you, it's exciting today. Jesus Christ completing the redemptive work upon the cross was sufficient to allow him to secure the keys to hell and death. In Revelation 1.18, the Lord Jesus Christ is seen in Revelation 1. And he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Meaning, so be it. And have the keys of hell and of death. In Ephesians 4, verses 8 through 10, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that 
ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. What is that saying? It is saying that Jesus Christ, while he was dead, uh, he did not ascend to heaven for those three days. He did the opposite. He went into hell. He went into hell because at the moment of his resurrection, he was going to claim his prize. Every soul of every Old Testament believer, every uh, uh, from Adam through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Ruth, Naomi, uh, the three Hebrew children, Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, they were all in a holding place. They were all in a part of hell that was actually referred to as a garden. The Jewish people referred to it as paradise. It is a holding place. It is referred to in the Jewish faith as Abraham's bosom. You see, believers in the Old Testament couldn't go to heaven. Jesus, the Messiah, had not come and provided the means for lost humanity to be saved and to go to heaven. Therefore, until the Lord came and rose from the dead, those spirits had to go somewhere. So where did they go? They went to hell, but they were not in torments. There was a part of hell. This is one of the reasons why I say anybody who tries to tell you hell is the same, you know, across the board, everybody in hell is going to experience the same identical uh, eternity. I don't believe that. The Word of God said God will reward every man according to his works. So therefore, uh, it's going to be different. Uh, you know, Adolf Hitler is going to have a very different experience than someone who perhaps simply rejected the gospel. So they were in a holding place. They were in a part of hell that was literally referred to as a garden, but it was still a confinement, meaning they were not free to come and go. <clears throat> if you've ever been in a jail or been in a psychiatric hospital where you're not free to come and go, you know that that is a miserable place to be. So it doesn't matter how if it was even reasonably nice, the reality is you're not free to move about. And they certainly were not in the presence of God. But it said, he that ascended, meaning that rose from the dead and, and ascended to God, said he first descended into hell. The word of God tells us he preached unto the spirits that were in prison there. And at the moment of his resurrection, soon as he rose from the dead, immediately all those spirits were released to be in the presence of God in heaven. Hallelujah. And he said, and he gave gifts unto men. And then he eventually ascended back to heaven so that, listen, so that he might fill all. Who does the word of God tell us? fills all, that you cannot escape his presence. You cannot go anywhere and be away from his presence. God, he's going to return to heaven so that he might once again sit in his place of deity and divinity. Hallelujah. Now that man, Jesus, that body, is placed at the right hand of God, just, just like a car in a garage. It's placed there because he's not done with it yet. He needs that to return and to claim the church. He needs that to, to uh, descend at the battle of Armageddon and defeat the armies of Satan and defeat the, uh, the evil men from Gog and Magog who come against Israel. He needs that body. He's still going to use that body. And that's why the word of God says that Jesus, the man, the humanity, sits at the right hand of God. God fills all of space. The word of God said, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. How in the world can you sit next to God? 
physically. It's impossible. God doesn't occupy a, a certain amount of space, okay? So that phraseology is used to imply that he's sitting in a place of power and authority. When you say someone is my right-hand man, you're saying that I give that guy the power to do just about anything I can do. He's my right-hand man. That's where we get that terminology from, that phraseology. So after all things are done, after the church has been redeemed and the, the world has, in effect, come to an end as we know it, then we see Jesus in the book of Revelation saying, it is finished. On the cross, he said, it is done, meaning the task he had come to do to die, to go to the cross for our sins. He said, it is finished. But there's still more that has been prophesied. There is still more that God spoke. There's still more that is part of the plan post his resurrection. And when all of that is complete, then the Lord declares it is finished. And the word of God said he will sit in the throne of God as God and the Lamb, because God became the Lamb. He became the sacrifice. So now in 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19, again, this uh, is what I was talking about a moment ago. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God or restore us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. That's what he did when he descended for three days into hell to preach and to declare to Abraham, to declare to Moses, to declare to the Old Testament prophets, to tell Daniel, it, and oh, hallelujah, even his, his cousin John the Baptist, listen guys, three days and you're out of here. Hallelujah. When I leave, you're leaving with me. Glory to God. And I'm taking the keys to hell and death with me, and those keys will never again be in the possession of Satan. Oh, hallelujah, I'm getting excited. God wanted his, a bride. He wanted a bride that was comprised of souls who have chosen to love and serve him. But for humanity to choose God as a love interest, listen, we had to have another option. Satan is, in effect, an alternate love interest. Hell was designed, listen, to house fallen Lucifer and those who in this life, worked with him to deceive and to destroy. They were created for that purpose. Hell, the word of God says, hell was created for the devil. A lot of people think hell was created as a place of punishment for the devil, so to speak. No, 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 no. This was God's deal with the devil. And all right, you don't want to serve me in heaven. You would rather reign. If you've ever read Dante's in, in Inferno, where the enemy, the, uh, Lucifer, says, I'd rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. That's exactly the deal that God made. The devil thinks I can beat God. I can sit in God's throne. But if I lose, according to the rules set forth by God, 
I'll have a kingdom to rule, and there will be spirits in that kingdom of men. All those that I can deceive, all those that I can convince to walk without faith, to walk without God, to not enter into a relationship with God. He said, all of those I get to keep, they will be in my kingdom that I'm operating, that I'm in control of. But that kingdom is going to be in the bowels of the earth. God is light. There, his kingdom is the opposite. It's going to be darkness. The word of God said uh, refers to uh, at least some areas of hell as outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the book of Revelation, we find out later the word of God says that uh, God casts hell itself into a lake of fire. So it is going to be surrounded, as it were, by a moat of flames and fire, liquid fire, okay? And so that is Lucifer's um, prize. If he loses this battle, that's what he's going to get. And he'll be able to torment those that he deceived, he'll be able to torment them. His demons will be able to torment those who've walked without faith, those who've rejected the gospel, those who have been deceived by him. He'll be able to, to, to torment them throughout eternity because he is not there to be punished, as it were. But no, that's the kingdom. That is the alternate prize that he gets. So he'll be able to be there yet as a tormentor. Okay? Now, uh, for, for Satan, hell is the opposite of heaven. All he sought and desired to possess will be denied him. And he will be relegated instead to a kingdom of darkness, flames, and misery. He and his angels, the demons, will be able to eternally reign in hell. He knew that would be his consolation prize if he were to fail in his insurrection against God. And those who did not choose to love and serve God but who chose instead to love and serve what is referred to in the word of God as the God of this world, which is Lucifer, will be able to enjoy his reign and his kingdom for all of eternity. In the end, heaven and hell are simply a choice of love interests. We choose to love and serve God, or we choose to love and serve this world, and Satan is the God of this world. That's why the Word of God says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, uh, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay? So again, many people see, when you preach heaven and hell, many people see that as uh, reward and punishment. Well, it is, and yet at the same time, it isn't. Because the reality is, no, you're choosing which kingdom you wish to spend eternity in. Do you want to spend eternity in the kingdom of God with light and liberty and the glories of heaven? Or would you rather spend eternity in a devil's hell that was not created for you. The Word of God tells us hell was created for the devil. Wasn't created for you. But if you love him so much and you love this world and you love the uh, way of this world so much and the things of this world so much, then that is the kingdom you're going to spend eternity in. So really, rather than strictly looking at it as reward and punishment, you have to look at it in terms of love interest. Which side did you choose to love? Which side did you decide in this life 
uh, you wanted to serve, and therefore you get to participate in that kingdom of your choice. Now, uh, we choose who to love and serve, and the choice results in which state we will live out eternity. We'll either live with our Heavenly Father in glory, <clears throat> or we will live with the God of this world in his dark and dismal kingdom. Now, talking about the rules that God set forth for himself, how he put himself in a box and he confined himself, and the enemy had lots of opportunities to try to affect circumstances and to do things in order to prevent the plan of God from coming to full fruition exactly as he had set it forth. It had to happen exactly as he set it forth in the prophecies of old. Listen, the books of the Old Testament contain many passages about the Messiah. All are prophecies of Jesus Christ which he fulfilled. For instance, the crucifixion of Jesus was foretold in Psalm 22, 16 through 18, approximately 1,000 years before Christ was born. Listen, long before crucifixion was practiced. The prophecy said he'd be hung upon a tree long before crucifixion was practiced, nailed to the tree. After Christ's resurrection, preachers of the New Testament church, <coughs> excuse me, began to declare officially that Jesus was the Messiah according to divine appointment. That's why in Acts 2.36, reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, I read it to you earlier in the King James, Peter said, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom ye crucified. Paul a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now bear in mind, many, 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 many of the prophecies concerning the Messiah, it would have been impossible for someone to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to have a baby, so I'm going to act like he's the Messiah, and I'm going to go through prophecies which, you know, there are a lot of people who love to, they, they try to discount the Bible. They try to talk about, oh, it's just a book. It was written by men, you know. Yeah, if you have a really simplistic understanding of the Bible, then you might say, oh, it's just a book written by men. But what you don't take into account is that it was written by men spanning over thousands of years. And you bring these texts together, and there are prophecies that are 500 years old. There are some that are 1,000 years old. There are some that are 2,000 years old. You've got some that are a few hundred years old. But there were prophecies scattered throughout the millennium before the arrival of Jesus Christ. So it's not like one person sat down and wrote this book and put all these things together. Uh-uh, didn't work that way. 
and the likelihood that one person could fulfill all these prophecies that were written at various times in human history and various times in the history of the Jewish people. It's mathematically, I'm going to get into it in a second. It is a statistical improbability. Some Bible scholars suggest that there are more than 300 Old Testament prophetic scriptures uh, concerning Jesus Christ. Various circumstances such as his birthplace, his lineage, the method of execution, these things were beyond the Lord's control and could not even have occurred accidentally, nor could they have been deliberately fulfilled. In the book Science Speaks, Peter Stoner and Robert Newman discussed the statistical improbability of one man, whether accidentally or deliberately, fulfilling, listen, just eight of the prophecies Jesus fulfilled out of more than 300. They said fulfilling just eight eight of those certain prophecies that he had no control over whatsoever. The chance of this happening is 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Stoner presents a scenario that illustrates the magnitude of such odds. Suppose we take 10 to the 17th power silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars, the entire state of Texas covered in silver dollars, the entire state covered in silver dollars two feet deep. Take one of those silver dollars and put a mark on it, Stir the whole mass thoroughly. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up one silver dollar and say that this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one? just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing just these eight prophecies, eight out of over 300, and having them all come true in any one man. From their day to the present time, that is, if they were writing using their own wisdom, the mathematical prob improbability of 300 prophecies or 47 prophecies or even just eight fulfilled prophecies of Jesus stand as evidence of his messiahship. There were prophecies, it said he would be born in Bethlehem said he would be born of a virgin. Now, of course, there are those who will say, well, but there's no proof Mary was a virgin. For all we know, she was raped or molested by somebody. Okay, so let's not even count that one if you don't want to. Uh, the improbability still stands of him fulfilling just eight of these. Said he would come from the line of Abraham, meaning he would be Jewish. Said he would be a descendant of Isaac, said he would be a descendant of Jacob, said he would come from the tribe of Judah. Out of 12 tribes, Jesus was born to a mother whose lineage is from the tribe of Judah. There's no way he could have controlled that. Messiah would be heir to King David's throne. Um, Messiah would spend a season in Egypt, which is exactly what happened when the babies were being killed in uh, Judah. 
And uh, Mary and Joseph were born by an angel, and they went into Egypt for a couple of years. They were exiled in Egypt. It was prophesied this would happen. It was prophesied there'd be a massacre of children uh, at the Messiah's birthplace. It was prophesied there'd be a messenger who would prepare the way for the Messiah, of course, John the Baptist. Um said Messiah would be rejected of his own people. Messiah would be a prophet. Messiah would be declared the Son of God. He would be called a Nazarene. Why was he called a Nazarene? Because after uh, Joseph and Mary returned from Egypt and they returned to the land of Israel, they took up residence in Nazareth. Being a Nazarene is not the same, my folks, uh, as taking the oath um, that Samson took. A lot of people make that mistake. But he would be called a Nazarene. Messiah would uh, speak in parables. This was prophesied. Psalm 78, 2 through 4, Isaiah 6 through 9, Matthew 13, 10 through 15, as well as 34 through 35. Messiah would be sent to heal the brokenhearted. He would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He would be called king when he was crucified. It was placed over his head. Uh, Jesus, king of the Jews. He didn't write that. That was written of him. He would be called the saint. It was prophesied he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. Messiah would be praised by little children. It was prophesied he would be betrayed. It was prophesied that uh, the money used to betray him, the money given to Judas to betray him, would be used to buy a potter's field. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, it was prophesied he'd be falsely accused. It was prophesied he would offer no argument. He would offer no defense while he was being tried in uh, and accused so that he might be crucified. The word of God tells us he said nothing. He stood there silently. It was prophesied that he would do this. It was prophesied he would be spat upon and struck. I mean, folks, these are pretty specific things. These are not some loosey-goosey, you know, broad things. No, it was prophesied that he would be spat upon and struck. We read that in Isaiah 50 and verse 6. Then we read the fulfillment of that in Matthew 26, 67. Messiah would be hated without cause. Listen, Messiah would be crucified with criminals. We read that in Isaiah 53 and 12. We see it fulfilled in Matthew 27, 38, Mark 15, 27 and 28. How in the world could the Lord have controlled that? How in the world could anybody have made that happen? Something that had been prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years prior that he would be crucified with criminals. How could he possibly have done that? It was prophesied Messiah would be given vinegar to drink. What did he do before he went up the hill? Ask the Romans, do me a favor, bring some vinegar with you so that I can have a drink, you know, just before I die. And as I said earlier, that was the last prophecy to be fulfilled. The very last one, Satan could have frustrated the plan of God if he had somehow been able to prevent the Lord from being given that vinegar to drink. Because every word of God has to be fulfilled. That's God's rules. Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. We read that in Psalm 22, 16, as well as Zechariah 12 and 10. It is fulfilled in John 20, 25 through 27. How in the world could something as specific as that have just happenstance been fulfilled? It was prophesied he would be mocked and ridiculed. 
It was prophesied soldiers would gamble for his garments. It was prophesied that none of his bones would be broken. It was prophesied that he would feel physically in his flesh, feel as though he had been abandoned by God. It was prophesied he would pray for his enemies. It was prophesied that a soldier would pierce Messiah's side. It was prophesied Messiah would be buried with the rich. And a rich man donated his tomb for Jesus to be buried in. So he was buried with among the rich. It was prophesied he would resurrect from the dead, that he would eventually ascend to heaven. There are a number of other prophecies, obviously, but I just want to give you some idea. Come on, folks. If you're an unbeliever today, if you don't believe this gospel, it is to your own detriment. There is no way in the universe anyone could have written a book consisting of dozens of authors, not one single author, like the Book of Mormon and the Pearl at Great Price and all that foolishness. No, 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 no. Dozens of authors over the course of many, many centuries. And yet somehow all these pieces come together like a big puzzle, which is why God declares that he reveals his truth to us line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. He literally gives it to us almost like a great big puzzle. And if we will study the scriptures and search the scriptures, keep things in context. And the word of God said, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If we will do that, this whole puzzle comes together and it makes one beautiful mosaic. It makes one beautiful picture. You literally can see how God started at creation at point A, and man fell and disobeyed God, and it all comes around. We get to the cross. God provides a way for man to be restored to his original estate. And we get to the rapture and the resurrection of the church. And guess what? We are right back where we started from. Everything Adam lost will be restored, including a new heaven and a new earth. So God, literally, the entire story of the Bible, the entire plan of salvation and redemption is one great big ring. It literally starts at one place, and it comes around over the course of thousands of years, and boom, when it's all over, it ends exactly where it started. We are restored right back to where we began as a race. All right, now, talking about the rules of the spirit realm. There are three types of activity that uh, demonic spirits, evil spirits, wicked spirits, uh, um, unclean spirits, as they're referred to in the Word of God, there are three types of activity that uh, demonic spirits can visit upon a human being. These are the rules. This is what they're confined to. There is vexation. Vexation is external. Generally speaking, vexation is something that occurs when we come into contact with someone or we are, um, when we're in fellowship with someone who has demonic activity of their own. Now, theirs may be oppression or possession, because there's vexation, oppression, possession. 
if you become involved with, and it can be as simple as a child being uh, babysat for by a woman who is possessed by a devil. I actually had a family in our church in Dallas who came to visit us, and uh, they loved us, and we loved them, and we were so happy that they began to come, and their daughter uh, was having some really, really um, serious signs of some sort of a demonic vexation. And uh, in the course of talking with the father, I discerned uh, something. And I said to him, I said, there's somebody that you're, you're putting her in the care of that has demonic activity going on in her life. And your daughter is becoming vexed. It's kind of like uh, if you go into the home of somebody and they own a bunch of monkeys and the monkeys are running around, uh, or even our dogs. Our dogs love to climb on our lap, you know, and they love to be lap dogs and they like to lick us and all that. Well, when a visitor comes in, my dogs are friendly. They'll lick all over you. They'll jump all over you if you let them, you know. And so... Uh, when you send your child to this home, she becomes affected by the spirits that this person has in their life. That person, again, it may be an oppression or it may be possession. Oppression is also external. Possession is internal, meaning possession, the spirit takes up residence oppression. The spirit is working from the outside and trying to uh, motivate you in a negative manner, in a negative way. It can be everything from a spirit of murder that's literally trying to motivate someone to kill. Uh, it can be a spirit of suicide. And that a suicidal spirit, which is very common if you watch a lot of these uh, ghost shows and what have you. See, if they understood these things the way we understood them, uh, they would easily, I am constantly saying to Tommy, we'll be watching a show, we've never seen it before, don't know anything about the storyline that we're watching, and I'll say to Tommy, ah, uh, this is what happened. Here's how this occurred. I can, because as information is coming, I'm able to put the picture together. I say, okay, this is how the door was opened. This is where the invitation was offered. This is what happened. And then as the story progresses, all of a sudden, guess what we hear? We hear something that further confirms exactly what I told him was the case. These ghost hunters, they don't put the, they don't put the pieces together. They don't even begin to understand how these things work together because they're not approaching these things from a biblical Christian perspective. If they did, then they would understand the rules of the spirit realm. And if you understand the rules of the spirit realm, then it is not hard at all to put together how uh, activity came about. It is not hard to understand how this person became vexed. It is not hard to understand how this person became oppressed. It is not hard to understand how this person became possessed. And uh, if uh, I'll give you an example concerning oppression, a suicidal spirit. A suicidal spirit will linger oftentimes where the individual has died that committed suicide. And they will always, spirits have one job. Each spirit, literally, this is part of the rules of spiritual, uh, of the spirit realm, okay? Each spirit is confined to one operation, okay? This is why they are called by name, not, you know, these ghost shows crack me up. The spirit calls itself Zaba Zaba. And oh, the demon's name is Zaba Zaba. No, no. Demons are identified by their work. In other words, the same way that human beings uh, over the centuries have... Uh, how their surnames have been developed. You know, John Carpenter. Well, 
that name goes back to antiquity when his forefather was a carpenter. That's where he got the name carpenter from, okay? And uh, demons are identified by the work they do. If that spirit is there to create depression, it is a spirit of depression. If that spirit is there to inspire one to commit suicide, it is a spirit of suicide, or we simply say a suicidal spirit. If it is a spirit that tries to motivate and push someone and inspire someone, encourage someone to commit murder, then it is a spirit of murder. If it is a spirit of lust that tries to, over, to motivate the person and overtake the person with a constant unbridled lust, which, my friend, we do not back away for one moment from saying that that is unhealthy and unsafe and that is not a way to live your life. Uh, a spirit of lust is responsible in some instances for many people over the centuries uh, winding up with venereal diseases, dying with such things as uh, uh, AIDS and dying with various venereal, because AIDS is not the only sexually transmitted death sentence that's ever existed. So it's idiotic and foolish to say that it is. Uh, but there are many who have wound up dying with a number of um, sexually transmitted diseases. And if you investigated their life, if you understood the circumstances of their life, I had an opportunity to sit down and ask a few questions. All I'd have to do is I know exactly where to go. I know exactly what to ask. And I would be able to determine uh, how it is that this person wound up. Uh, not everybody, mind you, that has... Uh, problems in the lust area. I'm not saying everybody is demon-possessed, but there is a spirit of lust. And all of these spirits, when you, when a spirit of anything begins to vex you or begins to oppress you, it is almost to the point of being just sheer overwhelming. It is, it is such a, um, it is a very powerful and a very uh, deep-seated uh, influence that that spirit has upon the person, okay? Uh, so in other words, just because you lust after somebody here and again, that doesn't mean you have a spirit of lust, okay? But uh, if you have a spirit of lust, and I've known people that did, I knew a lady years ago in her 70s. And the pastor of the church that I was uh, involved, it was my first apostolic church that I attended as a member. And the pastor told me he, he was trying to, to win this lady to the Lord, and he would visit her. And I forget, um, somebody knew her. She was related to somebody in the church or something. And he would, you know, he would try to be a testimony to her. And he uh, would have me go with him, you know, because he wasn't going to go by himself. Uh, preachers that believe in integrity uh, were very careful to make certain that just for the sake of appearances, there are many things, you know, we won't do alone, okay? Um, I won't counsel with a woman or a guy alone. Tommy will tell you, if I've got somebody that requires counseling, I ask them to either bring someone with them that they're comfortable having there, or are they comfortable if, if Tommy or one of the other church members, you know, uh, is with me, because I have to guard my integrity, okay? Uh, but I was going with this pastor, and we visited this lady, and he told me before we went in, he said, uh, Charles, I'm going to tell you right now, he said, this lady has the spirit of lust. And he said, so just be advised. I never saw anything like it in my life. That woman practically drooled 
over the pastor and I. Now, I was 30 years younger than he was nearly, at least 20 years younger. Uh, you you might have thought, well, she'd, she'd be flirty and, and, you know, going out of her way to, to try to uh, seduce the younger of the two. No. This woman, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I never saw anything like it in my life. She openly, just flagrantly, was trying to seduce he and I. It was the most wild thing I ever saw in my life. Uh, people can have a lying spirit. Uh, Donald J. Trump, I can tell you right now, has a lying spirit. I discerned that the first time I... Uh, heard him make a speech when he first announced he was running for president. Uh, there are a number of spirits that man has. And uh, I believe he is possessed. I do not believe he is oppressed. That man is possessed of demons. We'll be looking later at the rules as to how that, why I believe that, you know, and how that becomes possible. But anyhow, I'm, I'm trying to give you a quick breakdown before the end of today's study on the three types of activity. There's vexation, which is external. Matthew 15, 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Matthew 17, 15, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic, meaning he's simple-minded or he has mental health issues in modern vernacular, and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and off into the water. So this spirit that he has come into contact with is somehow trying to motivate him to do things that are self-destructive. You know, fall into the fire, fall into a body of water. Luke 6, 18, And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. Uh, Acts 5, 12 through 16, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both men of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also, now listen, there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits and they were healed every one. The term vexed in the Greek comes from uh, a word pasco. It is defined as to be affected by or have been affected, to feel, to have a sensible experience or a, a feel, uh, an experience in your within the realm of sensation, to undergo. Um, in a bad sense, it is to suffer sadly or to be in a bad plight, okay? So there is vexation. That is rubbing arms with the wrong people. This is why the Word of God warns us that bad communications corrupt good manners. Modern English, uh, bad associations with people that... that you know, we ought not to be associating with, can corrupt our conduct and our behavior. Because of why? Because of vexation. We can be rubbing arms with somebody. We can decide to go to bed with somebody. We can decide to hang out with somebody. We can decide to become friends with somebody uh, who is oppressed of the devil, has an oppression on them. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves vexed. We're, we're kind of getting 
a residual effect in relation to our uh, relationship with them. Okay? All right. So listen, folks, it is almost half past the hour, and uh, I've got a few minutes. Let me go ahead into oppression, and then that way next week we can go right into possession, okay? Which will be very interesting, I assure you. Oppression, again, is an external, but oppression is where we, you'll hear uh, people refer to an attachment. Okay, that is oppression. When you're not possessed of a devil, but that spirit has in effect attached itself to you. Okay, vexation comes and goes. You become uh, active with somebody, you know, you start hanging out with somebody who is oppressed. They have a spirit attached to them. While that spirit is attached to them, when you're around them, that spirit starts reaching out and it's trying to bother you. It's trying to frustrate you as well. It tries to affect you as well. Because the key in all of this, and we're going to look into it more deeply in the near future, is opening a door. Spirits cannot march in. There has to be an invitation. There has to be a door opening. Somehow, you have to purposely or inadvertently open a door or leave a door ajar, so to speak, in terms of our conduct and how we carry ourselves. We can open doors. And once that door is open, then the spirit can come in. And it can literally possess or take possession. Even as we rent a home or rent an apartment, the term is used, you take possession of the apartment. Now, you don't take the apartment somewhere, but rather you move into the apartment where it's at. The same is true of demon possession. The spirit's not owning you. He's not taking ownership of you. But what he is doing is he is taking up residence in you. And when we've opened a door and allowed a spirit to take up residence, we've given it permission to exercise far greater influence in our lives than oppression. Oppression, vexation leads to oppression. Oppression leads to possession, okay? However, at any point in that process, many negative, terrible things can occur. People can murder. People can uh, commit suicide. People can do all kinds of things under... Uh, uh, just simply by reason of vexation. They can do the same by reason of oppression once that spirit has attached itself. But once it's attached itself, now you've gone up a notch. The power's been turned up, so to speak. And now that spirit is able to influence far more powerfully than it did as a vexation. Because vexation, generally speaking, you have to be around that other person to experience the vexation. The story I was telling a little while ago about the little girl, uh, the man said to me, he said, actually, he said, now that you mention it, that makes a lot of sense. He said, we have a neighbor and uh, she loves our daughter and my daughter likes to go over to her house and hang out and stuff. And he said, but my goodness, now that you mention it, he said, every time she comes back from that woman's house, she is in one of these crazy moods. We didn't put it together. We didn't think about it, you know. But that's exactly what happened. You see, that vexation can put you in a bad mood. It can put you in a bad frame of mind. It can set you on a path for very negative thinking and, you know, uh, and so even though when you leave, you're no longer in the presence of the spirit that was vexing you, you at the same time still manifest behaviors. You're still reacting to the effect that that spirit had on you while it was vexing you. Then the next step up is oppression. 
the Spirit literally attaches itself. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Word of God said, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. The Greek word for oppressed is a rather long, lengthy, many-syllable word, kadadunastayu. Uh, <laughs> it's a long word, meaning to exercise harsh control over one or to use one's power against them. So when, you, when a spirit becomes attached to you, there's a reason. Because you've, in effect, given it permission. There's something you're doing that you don't mind doing. There's something you like to do. And that spirit comes along and says, okay, you like to lie? Well, boy, howdy, I'm going to encourage you to lie all you want. I'm going to encourage you to lie every time you open your mouth. And if you start doing that and you start getting things and achieving things and accomplishing things and accruing things by reason of your lying, and all of a sudden you see it as a way of life, you see it as a way of achieving and accomplishing and getting things. Well, I, man, I can lie my way into anything. Then the next step is you're opening the door to possession. Now a lying spirit can literally take up residence and it will control you. It will take the reins and it'll have you lying when there's no reason to lie. It'll have you saying things that are so off the wall and uh and there's no reason for your, your even to have done that. But you literally lose control, in effect, to even speak the truth. That is Donald J. Trump, but I'm not going to go into it a whole lot uh, tonight, okay? All right, it is half past the hour, and that means that our Bible study time has ended for this evening. I hope that you have been as inspired and as uplifted as I've been tonight, I also hope that maybe uh, as we're beginning now to look at uh, the types of demonic activity and the rules that apply uh, in relation to demonic activity, uh, I'm hoping this will be enlightening. I hope people will be empowered. I hope tonight, if you don't know Jesus Christ in truth, I hope maybe that you've heard enough to convince you, maybe I should believe on the Lord. And if you live here in the Huntsville, Alabama area, run, don't walk. Hallelujah. Come be with us in church. We baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins according to the biblical mandate spoken by Peter in Acts 2.38. And we will be more than happy to arrange to baptize you in the name of the Lord and, uh, and to pray for you as well that you might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is, in case you don't know, which is the Spirit of God doing exactly what demons are trying to do, taking up residence within you. But guess what? The rules apply. God only enters by invitation. He never forces himself upon anyone. There has to be an open door, an invitation. We'll be talking more about that in the next week or so. Let's close our Bible study Whoops! tonight with prayer. Boy, I'm getting old and dropping things. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Ooh, I feel so good. I want to get up and dance a little. Hallelujah. I love the Spirit of God. Master, in the name of Jesus, glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Master, in the name of Jesus, I pray God right now in the authority of the Holy Ghost by the power of Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, for those that are watching, those, Master, right now who may be vexed, they're keeping company with someone who has an oppression, someone who is under the influence of a dark spirit.
And Master, right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, as they are under the sound of my voice, I speak to that spirit and I command it to flee in Jesus' name right now upon the authority of God's word. Master, break the bonds today. Break the chain. Deliver even at this moment. The word of God declares you send forth your word to heal. You're able to accomplish this today, Lord, through nothing more than the word of your mouth. And today, I quote the word of God. I stand upon the authority of the word of God. And you've given your children today, Lord, power to cast out devils and to come against everything that would exalt itself above the higher knowledge of a living God. Master, break the chains of addiction, that spirit of addiction. Break it right now. Crush it, Master, in the name of Jesus. That suicidal spirit, Lord, that spirit of depression, that spirit of despair, that spirit of loneliness. Oh, Master, right now in the name of Jesus, break that demon's back. Send him back to the pit of hell from whence he came. Oh, Master, you declare in the word of God, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. You're able to accomplish these things, Lord. You don't have to send angels. You don't have to send warriors. All you have to do is be invited to the scene. And when the presence of the Lord arrives, liberty comes with it. Master, let those who are struggling right now invite the presence of God into their home. Invite the presence of God into their lives. Master, let them right now speak an invitation that you, Lord, might have access to their life. Lord, please enter into relationship with me. I want to walk in relationship with you. Master, I invite you into my life. And oh, God, today, Help us, Lord, to meditate upon that which we've heard. Help us, Lord, to consider that which we've heard tonight. Let it not be words which have fallen upon ten ears. But, Master, let the word which has been spoken tonight speak to the heart of the unbeliever. Speak to that one who has not yet been born again the Bible way. But, Lord, speak as well to the heart of the believer. For many believers become vexed. Many believers become oppressed. All because they've decided to leave a door ajar. They've decided to open a door. They've made an invitation, wittingly or unwittingly. And Master, today, let this word today be the source of their deliverance and their victory. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord. And we thank you for that which you're doing in this Bible study. We ask all this and none other than Jesus' precious saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, I hope you're enjoying this Bible study. We don't get very many comments. I wish people, I, I ask people to leave comments on Facebook and on YouTube and stuff. <clears throat> but we get a whole lot more viewers than we do comments. So uh, we're always grateful for feedback. That lets us know uh, if we're doing a, a good job, if we're conveying what we're trying to convey, if you're getting it, if you're understanding it, if it's helping you, uh, if you have a situation in particular that you are uh, needing information about, don't hesitate to send me a message or put it on uh, the comments section. And in a future uh, study, I will be certain to address the specific situation or circumstance that you bring up. We're more than happy to do that. That's why social media has the ability to like a video and share a video and most importantly to make comments. So we appreciate feedback if you'll uh, take the time to give us some feedback.
I hope you'll join us Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. If you live outside of the Huntsville, Alabama area, then you can worship with us live, both on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, we are live at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. So obviously that's 4 o'clock on the East Coast and 1 o'clock on the West Coast. But you can join us live if you're not able to join us live all our teaching, all our Bible studies, all our sermons, all of our complete live services are archived on our YouTube channel. If you go to our YouTube channel, um, just look up Forward Christian Life Center on YouTube. Go to our channel there uh, and... We have playlists, you know, a playlist of live services, playlist of sermons alone, playlists of each Bible study series um, separated by topic. So, you know, you have access. You can go back if, if you're just joining us today and you haven't seen the first five sessions in this study. You can go to uh, YouTube and you can look at the playlist for ghosts, ghouls, and bumps in the night, and all of the videos for this series are available to you there. When it's all done, if we've done 20 sessions, which we're likely to do, then all of them will be there, and you'll be able to watch the whole series. Uh, if you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, folks, God is trying to do something powerful and wonderful in this city, and we don't need you to watch us online. We need you to come worship with us. Okay, there is power in the people of God unifying. There is power uh, in us coming together. The Word of God said, where two or three agree as touching any one thing, it shall be done unto them of our Father which is in heaven. The Word of God also promises that where two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. It also promises... Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If you are oppressed, if you are vexed, I'm telling you, you can find deliverance and victory in the presence of God. But you can't just sit at home lazy and expect God to step in and do something for you. No, no. Get to the house of God. Come worship with us. Uh, Century Office Center, 3322 Memorial Parkway Southwest. We're, we have a small suite at this time. We can hold about maybe 50 or 60 people at the moment. Um, but we want you to come worship with us. And we're in suite number 537. That's Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, and you can... Uh, we're on the opposite side of the highway from the Memorial Mall in Huntsville, on the opposite side of the freeway there, and just up, you know, a couple of blocks. So come be with us Sunday at 3. Also, next Wednesday night, of course, we invite you to come and be with us for the next installment of this Bible study, 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. And I believe when we're done with this study, uh, if you don't know God, you'll know Him. And once you know Him, honey, you're empowered like you've never been empowered in your life. And there is not a demon in hell that can vex or torment you in Jesus' name. I hope you'll come be with us again. Until we see you next time, God bless you in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name is our prayer.